Nobody does it better. Makes me feel sad for all the rest. Nobody does it half as good as you. Baby, you're the best. I wasn't looking, but somehow you found me. I tried to hide from your love light, but like heaven above me, the spy who loved me is keeping all my secrets safe tonight. And nobody does it better than the Bootleg Universe video cast. Woo. Welcome back. <laughs> that was amazing. I love that. All right. I am Lasky, Sam Lasky, mm -hmm. writer and producer at Bootleg Universe, and I'm joined today by... Clark. Kenlon Clark. The uh, director and editor uh, at the Bootleg Universe and uh, with the Guardians of Justice. And I am Hughes, Graham Hughes, uh, VFX artist and uh, Bond neophyte at Bootleg <laughs> Universe. <laughs> Today, because uh, Adi Shankar is off in Dubai or London or somewhere globe hopping like James Bond, yeah. we are going to... Uh, do whatever the heck we want, because he's paid for the studio space. So this is our time now. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're recording an episode, maybe the first of many, that we're calling Bondversations. Graham, <laughs> Graham, put a Bondversations. Put a, put a put a graphic when I go Bondversations. Mm -hmm. yes. Can do a Bondversations. Bondversations. No, no, you gotta. Okay. Bonver Bondversations. That was terrible. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we wanted to talk James Bond because it's a huge influence on, on me and Ken and to a much lesser extent, Graham. <laughs> when Ken and I were uh, in the editing room, the tiny, tiny, sweaty, smelly editing room of Guardians of Justice for months on end, uh, you learn a lot about the, the person you're sitting next to. And fortunately, we were able to bond a lot about a lot of things, but primarily over the James Bond franchise. We bonding bonded. on Bond. Bonding on Bond. We bonded. We, we bonded James Bonded. We sure did. Oh, this is going to be one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's already pressed stop on the... <laughs> So, Ken, why don't you uh, start us off by talking about how you got into the Bond franchise as a fan? What uh, was the what was the spark? How old were you? What was your first movie? Yeah, uh, well, Bond has always been a big influence. Uh, I mean, for like for a lot of people, myself included. My first, uh, probably, I guess I would say. Exposure to Bond was I saw uh, both Timothy Dalton films at the Dollar Theater when I was uh, uh, but a wee tyke. So <laughs> we used to go to the Dollar Theater, um, of course. Ooh, we so, had a Dollar Theater, yeah. but that's because I'm from Kentucky. Right. That, it's you're, because you're old. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so but the way, but when you when you are a, a kid, of course, you don't know the difference. So I think uh, The Living Daylights I saw in the theater when I was... Uh, too, probably too young to watch that. Um, and absolutely loved it. Loved Bond all growing up. Obviously, GoldenEye was a big influence um, in those years when I was a young <clears throat> teenage filmmaker running around making my own movies. And ever since, it's just been... It's been a passion, a love. Uh, I, own, I have every Bond film on Blu-ray, um, except for one. Um, and I rewatch them and revisit them fairly regularly. And in a lot of ways, uh, just re it's a reminder of uh, how well the films hold up overall in terms of, you know, filmmaking and storytelling and uh, just a general sense of adventure. Yeah. I have to ask, which <clears throat> one do you not own on Blu-ray and why? Oh, I don't own Diamonds Are Forever. Mm -hmm. um, only reason is uh, it's a little harder to get as a Blu-ray. Um, <clears throat> That's about it. It's also, let's be honest, one of, it's bottom five, probably. Probably, yeah. So it's a little, and, and of course now all of the films are available on um, Amazon. As part of the MGA, uh, MGM uh, purchase. Yeah, yeah, so you can access them anytime you want, but almost everything looks better on Blu-ray. It just does. Yeah. So. And also... Physical media will always be king. You can't trust the streaming services to have your movies and TV shows forever. They're not your friends. Well, for a long time, uh, Bond was only available. I'm sorry, except for Netflix, yes. which is the greatest. <laughs> of all. And uh, if any Netflix executives are watching this, oh, we love you. Guardians of Justice season two? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, they and and for a while, you know, I know that the Bond films were being were rotated amongst like I, this is years ago, Netflix and Amazon yeah. and stuff, and so it used to be kind of a seasonal thing that like the Bond films would be available all of a sudden for like three months around Christmas, and so you just kind of like indulge. But now it seems as though they're available for anybody to watch at any time if you have an Amazon Prime. And when did you start going back to the earlier Bonds and, and um, complete the viewing experience? Uh, probably when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Mm-hmm. I really, really like my early 20s were probably uh, for me where I kind of left behind, um, I would say, kind of just the movies that were being presented to me. Um, you know, what was in the theater and what was kind of current and what was very influential and kind of was like, oh, let's dive much more back and let's go back into back in time and and watch and catch up on um, everything that's ever Mm -hmm. been made. Um, And so the Bond films were a big part of that. And I would watch them. I think I watched them in like sequence of Bond actor. So Mm -hmm. I just kind of went back and started at the beginning and then moved uh, all the way through. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my experience with the Bond franchise, uh, when I was a kid, I used to spend, my little brother and I used to spend every Saturday night at grandma's house to give our parents, you know, a break once a week to do whatever adults do when their kids are not there that I don't want to think about, but I'm now thinking about. <laughs> um, and uh, my grandma was a cinephile actually. And so most of my early cinema knowledge came from her, like Jaws, Indiana Jones, Star Wars, all the, all the basic stuff that you watch growing up. Um, and for like a year or two, when I was nine or 10, uh, one channel played a Bond movie every night. I think it might've been ABC. Uh, and so I, Every Saturday, my grandma and I would watch a Bond movie. Of course, it started at like 8 (laughs) o'clock and went with commercials until 11.30. So I usually fell asleep by the halfway point. So I think I had seen most of the Bond movies halfway through by the time I was like 11. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until really Skyfall came out that I made the deliberate effort to go back and rewatch every single Bond movie in chronological order. I had seen all the Daniel Craig's, I had seen GoldenEye, but beyond that, I hadn't seen anything before that. So Skyfall was what, 2011, 2012, 2012. So I would have been 22. Uh, Yeah, that was when I went back and, and became a completist because I'm (laughs) <laughs> anal retentive like that. I have to see every movie by the director. I have to see every movie in the franchise. I can't, I can't skip anything. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I fell in love with, with the Bond movies because it, it, all the reasons we're going to talk about today, but I think the, the filmmaking, especially in the Sean Connery uh, and then uh, the George Lazenby Bond, uh, is some of the most interesting of its era in ways that people don't fully appreciate how innovative and interesting it is. Now, Graham, when we were in France, we dragged you to go see No Time to Die. Yeah, I was, I mean, <laughs> you're I was all jet lagged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was into it because I've been I've been a fan of the uh, Craig Bond movies, but I will admit, I had, had prior to this month, I had never seen any of the. Uh, older like classic bond movies like really anything prior to pierce brosnan but you Uh, had probably seen goldeneye i had probably caught part of it on tv one time you but you were you were also of the generation that probably played goldeneye the video game oh yeah uh goldeneye for sure um um i for some reason i thought you were saying goldfinger no um, no. yeah uh no i uh i was versed in the hit adaptation of the n64 game goldeneye (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh great game Right, that was probably like my uh, my formational Bond experience, I suppose, was Goldeneye because that was you know it was ninety five. That was the one that was came out when I was a kid, and just was super popular and existed while I was forming opinions about things. So um, yeah, and so over the last month, when we decided that we were going to do this episode, you've been going back and yes. watching. 
And I've now, so my, my opinions might be uh, interesting because they're based on a blitz of Bond knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've now seen, um, I think, 19 out of the 25. Wow. So I'm, okay. missing, I'm missing two of the Connery ones and four of the Moore ones. That I've yeah, that's understandable. Right. <laughs> It's more just would not stop doing them. <laughs> <laughs> his his toupee just flapping in the breeze when he's uh, by yes. by uh, wanted a, more a view to a kill. <laughs> more, more. We'll see. Uh, I do not have nostalgia going into this, so I may have what you would consider hot takes, or maybe we're surprisingly aligned. We in our we want the hot takes. We'll see. We want the hot takes. So why don't we start with you? Um, I think the first question, just to lay the groundwork for this conversation, is top five Bond movies. Do you think you can give us a top five as someone new to the franchise? Right. So it's really hard for me to divorce uh, uh, modernity from this. Okay. So um, I'd be lying if I didn't say like Casino Royale and Skyfall took the top two spots like pretty easily. Which I think probably for most people... That would be the case, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I did find that the other three spots were uh, were taken by other things. I have notes here because I absolutely will not remember any of these names without them. Okay, every Bond movie name is just like blends together so so seamlessly. Uh, let's see. Um, I kind of spoiled the top two, but just for the sake of drama, let's go in reverse order for the others. Uh, number five, I had as uh, License to Kill. Okay. Okay. That is a hot take. Yeah. Is it? That's a hot take. Because yeah. I think I think even the people who I mean, we love the Timothy Dalton movies, yeah. but I think for most people who like the Timothy Dalton movies, that's second to the Living Daylights. Yeah. Really? That's why. Why? Uh, um, let's go on this. We're very interested. <laughs> yeah. In what uh, made you decide that? Well, it was the first <clears throat> one that really seemed to be like a break in the formula, where like. Bond is out there not doing traditional Bond stuff. Like he's not just going on a mission to meet the bad guy and, you know, meet him at some kind of swarmy, you know, social event and um, basically announce, hi, I'm Bond. I'm here to kill you. <laughs> right. It's, it's Bond. So for those who haven't seen it, um, the movie starts with this amazing uh, sequence in which, Bond and Felix Leiter, his American counterpart played by Jeffrey Wright in the modern movies, I forget who plays him in in License to Kill, they attack a plane with another plane by (laughs) latching cables onto it and then kidnap somebody out of that plane. And if that sounds familiar, it is because Christopher Nolan ripped it off whole cloth for the opening (laughs) of The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, I had the the exact same thing where they're like dragging the plane behind the other. Right, right. It's It's fantastic. uh, a, A... If you've seen a lot of Bond movies, you will see a lot of stuff that Nolan steals from those movies, which is fine, which is fine. I love Christopher Nolan, but uh, yeah, the opening of The Dark Knight Rises is totally taken from the opening (laughs) of License to Kill. Then Felix Leiter is dangled over a shark pit and gets his legs bitten off Mm -hmm. (laughs) on his wedding day. (laughs) <laughs> and so James Bond decides to go rogue against M's orders and track down the the man responsible. And to be fair, Bond is kind of known for going rogue. That's kind of like a, a trade. That's kind of the default lever you press when you want to give Bond stakes. It's like, oh, no, now it's personal. But this is like the roguest he's ever gone. Where he's right. just like off the reservation completely and just doing his own thing. And they... Revoke his license to kill, which right. is why, do you know the original title of License to Kill? I do not. It was originally called License Revoked. Yes, oh, that's right. Yeah. It's kind of better. It's a much better title. I think they were like, ah, but are people going to get that it's his license to kill that's revoked and not his driver's license? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a very dark Dark movie. A young Benicio del Toro is in it. And he's so creepy. Yeah, I and it. It, he's he's the one who like dies in a meat grinder, right? Yeah, yeah. It might be the most violent Bond movie, even compared to the Craig movie. It's very gruesome. They really don't hold anything back for mm-hmm. most of it, which is uh, again like it just says so many things different to break from the standard of Bond, and I, I always appreciate when any franchise is willing to do that. And there's like a certain, and we'll we'll get into Dalton obviously yeah. as Bond, but there's a certain kind of seething quality, 
like with Bond in that film. Like there's, it does feel more like you can get a sense of like a rage kind of boiling under the surface with him as opposed to the previous iterations of Bond where he's a little more unflappable. He gets to act more than Bond does in most movies. Like he actually is like actually giving a performance, which is cool. Yeah. All right. Number four, uh, Goldeneye. Again, Mm -hmm. as I've said, uh, uh, my foundational bond, but with with perspective, I you know did a little bit of research, like the most cursory research, and saw that it had like a six year gap between the previous film and that one, mm-hmm. and it really, in context, feels like it uh, uh, was a just a cool fresh start in a similar way to the way Casino Royale was a fresh start for the series and kind of like revitalized it and was trying to breathe new life into it. Like, I also think that six year time gave them like. It gave them enough time to write an, a story with themes, <laughs> um, which is a novel novelty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was the first one written by Purvis and Wade, right? Yes, and and no, absolutely, and no source material whatsoever. You like I, completely I, original. I believe so. So I, I was going to talk about this later as one of our mm-hmm. topics, but I think since you brought it up, this six-year gap is a really interesting mm-hmm. historical moment for the Bond franchise. Um, we'll start by, Ken, do you want to explain what the Eon Bond franchise means, what the Eon refers you, to? I think you could probably do a better okay. explanation of that. But um, but obviously there's certain levels of you know legalities, and I think that this has kind of always been a little bit of a... Um, uh, a bit of an issue for the Bond franchise to some degree because I think the ownership that you know the ownership is constantly and I mean going even further back and but not going into it but you know never say never again and things like so that. there was there was a TV movie version of Casino Royale based on the novel that was the first cinematic portrayal of James Bond um, and then there was uh, a comedic version of Casino Royale with a bunch of different Bonds and a Blofeld and I think Woody Allen was in it and maybe Peter Sellers. I've never seen it. But the Eon Productions, Eon Productions. Sam will give you a much more detailed <laughs> okay. Trust All me. Right. So. so Eon Productions was a uh, company founded by Albert Cubby Broccoli, um, a, who uh, basically they made only James Bond movies. They bought the rights to all the James Bond novels from uh, Ian Fleming, and they made nothing but James Bond movies and uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's their only <laughs> non-Bond. <laughs> Ian Fleming uh, were the inclusion. Yeah. What? Ian Fleming wrote Chitty Chitty okay. Bang Bang. Okay, okay. Yeah. I guess that makes sense then. I didn't know that. So uh, the traditional chronology of the Bond franchise, is we consider only the Eon Bonds. Um, Sean Connery would return with a non-Eon Bond movie called Never Say Never Again based on uh, a previously optioned screenplay that uh, uh, Ian Fleming had written. And the rights get very confusing. We don't have to go into it. But so after The Living Daylights, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, after uh, License License to to Kill, Kill, the second Dalton movie, Albert Cubby Broccoli dies. And... Eon Productions is taken over by his daughter, Barbara Broccoli, and his stepson, uh, Michael Wilson, uh, who have run Eon up to this day. So the six-year gap between License to Kill and GoldenEye represents the transition of the franchise from the original founder to his kids. Interesting. And what's really interesting about GoldenEye is it's kind of the first movie made by people who grew up with James Bond. Yeah. And understood James Bond as a as this ephemeral concept. You can kind of feel that right um, in the in the making of it. And so the Pierce Brosnan Bonds I feel like are all trying to live up to this grand platonic ideal of what a Bond movie is. They all are very beholden to the formula of Crazy villain, secret lair, the plot, the gadgets, the henchmen, they all have every element of the formula Mm -hmm. because they're all trying to be the 
quintessential bond and include all the elements. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, that's why you see this really interesting uh, uh, transformation of what the Bond franchise is between, what, 1987, 88, and 1994. Yeah. Yeah. As an excellent explanation. Okay. Um, and it's true, like, there's more of a kind of... A, there's a self-aware. self-awareness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, probably Pierce Brosnan's uh, yeah. Bond films. But GoldenEye is... Uh, I mean, <clears throat> feels like it doesn't feel like a huge. I, to me, it doesn't feel like maybe from License to Kill to Goldeneye there is a little bit, but he still feels very, I think, a little grounded and a little more gritty in that iteration of Bond as compared to you know as he die another day. Yeah, yeah. So, the, the transition from the beginning to the end of the Brosnan era is pretty dramatic. Yeah, yeah, and then. I th- and then I think if you contrast that, the Brosnan era with the Craig era, where the Brosnan era was leaning into the platonic ideal of the Bond movie, the Craig era is swerving away from the platonic ideal <laughs> of the Bond movie. But in both cases, it's people who grew up with Bond. It's the second generation reacting to the idea of Bond. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. All right. Cool. So number three. Number three, and the the last one before basically just take Skyfall and Casino Royale, take the top two spots. But um, this one is Moonraker. Moonraker, okay. Absolute madness, top to bottom. It's got like just, just random bizarre assassination attempts mm-hmm. and astronaut laser battles in space and Jaws has a redemption arc and the villain has an army of like himbos and babes and it's just, it has everything. <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It really is... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's right. So uh, I'm going to turn the audio off here. This is the opening of Moonraker, and it's one of the greatest stunt sequences of all time. James Bond is obviously betrayed by the woman that he's sleeping with on a plane. There's not enough parachutes, and Bond jumps out of the plane without a parachute in order to catch the guy who has the parachute, rip the parachute off of him, and... uh, survive because otherwise he's going to die in the plane crash. Now, it, this is just an absolutely stunning sequence that uh, another great filmmaker ripped off for another great action movie, <laughs> which is Point Break. Um, right. And uh, obviously it's not Roger Moore doing these stunts, but they do a great job of making him look enough like yes. Roger Moore. And just the, I mean... This is this is Tom Cruise shit before Tom Cruise did Tom Cruise shit. <laughs> this is obviously they both have parachutes under their their costumes, but it is just exhilarating and terrifying. Uh, I can't imagine watching this in theater. I know my palms would be sweating, especially at the time where you just like you did you just didn't have sequences like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I'd say, I mean, talking about Tom Cruise, I think that, like, in a lot of ways, you know, not to go on a, you know, digress here, but, you know, the, the lot, a lot of that very practical stunt work and everything like that is is Tom Cruise kind of keeping a lot of this, we'll say, art form alive. Right. Like, I, yeah, the Bond franchise mm-hmm. really innovated the modern stunt mm-hmm. the modern stunts as a as an important spectacle in the action mm-hmm. movie that it's you know the stunt work had always existed but you know to bring it back to like the crazy stuff that you know Harold Lloyd or Buster Keaton was doing in the teens and 20s um, and incorporate that into a, a modern action movie it really kind of started with the bond franchise. Yeah, I don't have the knowledge to back this up, but you definitely get the impression going through them that there's like they're creating the standard of like a set piece driven action movie. Yeah. Like that's so a lot of people are like, ah, oh, Moonraker is is when it the Bond franchise jumped the shark <laughs> uh because he goes off into space. What what for you made that not the case? Why why didn't you feel like this was one step too far? I feel like Moonraker is when the Bond franchise as a whole really hit on the formula Mm -hmm. that just, um, that kind of defines, it feels like this is what the earlier Connery films were, were trying to do, but couldn't get to that point. They just didn't have, they didn't know what they wanted to be. 
just yet. And uh, more era kind of gradually arrived there and it's like, oh, okay, cool. This is, this is what we've been trying for this entire time. Yeah. It's just like, it's bonkers. It's absolutely insane, but like in a good way where it's just having a lot of fun with itself. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was trying to just, as we were talking, have uh, Hugo Drax in the background, but it's mm-hmm. not, uh, it's not loading. So, uh, there we go. yeah. So, you know, the, the climax of the movie obviously takes place on this, space station uh, created by Hugo Drax, who is like the quintessential Bond mo- mm-hmm. uh, Bond villain. He's the villainiest Bond villain. I always mm. thought that uh, if they ever actually remade Moonraker, you know who I want to play Hugo Peter Drax? Dinklage. Yes, he that's looks- exactly what I was going to say. It's, it's uncanny. So Hugo Drax is all about destroying the Earth and then creating a new master race in space. It's this very eugenicist, Nazi kind of thing. But it's, and it is, you're right, it is so over the top, but it is so quintessentially Bond. And I think, you know, the Austin Powers movies are probably more influenced by Moonraker than any other Bond movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Austin Powers movies exist in this world where the, you know, they're only, they, they only work, they're only funny because we as an audience have a collective understanding of the James Bond movies. Right. And you're right, this is kind of the quintessential Bond movie in that way. You, it has everything, this is what you think of when you think of Bond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's outlandish villain plans and yeah. outrageous layers. Right. By the way, shout out to the best villain layer in the entire franchise. <laughs> Like yeah. the the uh, the set design for this space station is just incredible. Like it's was so cool. Ken? Do you know if Ken Adams was still working at this point? Know. I'm not sure if this was him. It's right. it, it is just like it's so elaborate. And <clears throat> anytime there's like yes, yeah, space commandos with laser beams on their shoulders, um, fighting in space, it just is really like it's taking. I mean, I it's true. I don't think the Bond franchise has gone farther out. Um, you know, both kind of a literal sense with the story and then also creatively than Moonraker. And it is funny because it, it does kind of get a li- it's dismissed, um, I think, more so than some of the other films. But I think it has a few very cheesy elements like they give Jaws a girlfriend mm-hmm. like it's it's got some of the silliness that would really ruin movies like um, uh, Octopussy. Yeah. Um, so Ken, since Graham's given us his top five, do you want to, oh do you want to run through? This is really hard. Fifth to first. <laughs> this is really, this is very challenging. I'd say that this and, uh, another topic were, uh, very, very difficult. Um, I would say number five, the spy who loved me. Okay. Um, which is the movie right before Moonraker. And it's the one that I always give is like, if, if you, if an alien came down to earth and had never seen a bond movie and mm-hmm. needed to know what a bond movie was for their research into right. human it's beings, it's the same story as Moonraker, but just more grounded. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. They don't go to, sp- well, they go under the water. <laughs> they go deep beneath the ocean instead of, it's like the same plan. It's like, let's kill everyone on earth and repopulate. <laughs> right. Instead of in space, we're going to repopulate at the bottom of the sea. Yeah. Um, uh, it feels there's something about it that does feel I guess grounded in a good way, even though it is still obviously super elaborate. Um, Roger Moore just looks like super cool in this one. I don't know what it is um, in that, particularly the end sequence. The one, one of the scenes I absolutely love in that movie is when he is he's riding on top of that. He's hanging onto the thin, the he's putting the detonator uh, to blow out the wall, and. It's just there's something about that scene that just like always stuck in my mind of how kind of like out of all the people there, Bond is the guy who's the one, you know, kind of doing the mission. Um, So I love that. Obviously, I love the underwater car, um, which you can see on display at a gas station outside of Las Vegas. (laughs) 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 It's true. They have uh, I can't remember which way it's by state line. Um, they have this massive convenience store gas station. And I walked in, this was last year, and the actual car, there was two were, that were built, the underwater vehicles. Um, one of them is just sitting on display, like right next to the, the where you pay for, you know, your snacks. That's so random. It's so random. And it was found in a junkyard down in the uh, Bahamas where they filmed it. And somebody found it and then they they repurposed it, I think, for a television series. So it's there. And then apparently Elon Musk bought the other one. 
um, and is trying to actually turn it into a actual submarine uh, car. I'm so. sure he will follow through on that as he follows through on everything. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's what it says on the actual like sign go. display. So um, yeah, the spy All love right. me. I love it, um, <laughs> and I think just the opening, you know, the whole thing with Bond killing the um, the woman, uh, the female spy's lover. Yeah, um, you know, kind of creates like an interesting. I don't know, tension in a, in a cool way. All right, number four. Um, Goldfinger. Um, I think also one of the bondiest of Bond films that there is um, in a lot of ways also. Uh, uh, I think probably uh, it's the third Connery film, and which is interesting because also uh, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me is the third Moore film. Um so there's something about the three in a, in a weird way with some of the Bond. Uh, Skyfall is the actors. third. Skyfall yeah. is also the third Craig film. So um, Goldfinger, uh, obviously the, you know, uh, Bond, you know, strapped to the thing and the, you know, the laser coming up on him um, is just one of the most, I think, like iconic images of a Bond film. Um, That's the most iconic line in any Bond film, I think. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. There is nothing you can talk to me about that <laughs> yeah. I don't already so, know. One of the best lines, uh, one of the best villains. Sean Connery looks super cool. Huge movie. I think when this when the this premiered back in the day, they were playing it 24-7 in movie theaters uh, for the first while. It was an absolute massive phenomenon uh, in the Bond franchise. From Russia with Love and Goldfinger were both in the top 10 of 1963. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, one of the best films, probably my favorite, I think probably my favorite Sean Connery film, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, three, I would say the, uh, the Living Daylights. Um, uh, love Dalton, the Dalton Bond. That's the first Bond film I saw in the theater. So there's uh, going to be a little nostalgia that's being, you know, that is influencing this decision. But I also love, um, I love the cello scene, the cello case scene. <laughs> the yeah. Bond escapes on a, in a cello case. Um, I love that whole sequence with the car on the uh, lake bed. The And I absolutely love, and this was so weird as a kid, but I loved that when Bond walks into the opening and he's going to, you basically provide cover or take out the sniper. Um, he, he takes his suit and he flips up the collar and it turns into this sniper suit. <laughs> um, like he just transforms this, like it looks so cool. And I remember as a kid, anytime I had to wear a suit jacket, I kept, I'd always try that. So um, <laughs> there's just something about it that was just, it's just awesome. And, and Dalton's Bond is fantastic. The opening scene is so great. Um, the whole Jeep chase on the mountain. Um, great introduction into Timothy Dalton, Bond. Um, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. Uh, two, he said, this is what, this gets really hard. Um, I'm probably going to say Casino Royale. Okay. Um, and the only reason I say it's hard is because I, I love Skyfall. I absolutely love Skyfall. So, um, but you only felt like you could include one Craig yeah, on the list. Yes. Yeah. So I would probably pick Casino Royale um, because of a couple many reasons. But obviously, the opening action sequence is just phenomenal. Um, it's an excellent, in a weird way, it is an excellent adaptation of the Bond book of Casino Royale as a novel. Because what it does is in the novel. If I remember, I, I honestly, I haven't read it in a while, but if I remember correctly, it picks up when he is basically going into the, the, uh, to go play, um, in the game. So he's with Lashif and he's basically there and they're getting ready to actually do the gambling and the playing poker and all that stuff. Um, and so what they did with the, with the movie that's so interesting is it per the first hour of that film provides this backstory completely that doesn't exist in the novel but shows you how you get up into the novel story. And it's so cool. And of course, Bond is so raw. Um, and he's just as he's referred to this blunt object. Um, he's like this destroying killing machine. Um, I think I think it has my f second favorite Bond 
exchange uh, after this one, which is, uh, how did your contact die? How did my contact die? Not well. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. The second is, yeah. <laughs> yes, considerably. That's so great. <laughs> Such a great uh, tone setter. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I mean, the, yeah, black and white opener, like just some really like, I mean, a definite, like, it definitely was saying like, this is a different take on Bond or, or, or that it's returning to the roots that are probably closer to how Bond is represented in the, in Ian Fleming's writing, which yeah. is a little more, uh, he care he's, he's not, I don't want to say cynical, but he's a little more, there's an edge to him. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's less of a, you know, kind of lift, raising the eyebrow, smiling type character. And he's, uh, he's a re slightly reluctant agent. They're, they're definitely leaning into the killer aspect of being a trained killer. Like in yeah. the, in the, the novels, he was like, you know, the womanizing was sort of an aspect of him being kind of uh, dehumanizing everyone he meets. Mm -hmm. And they kind of just lean into that as being like, oh, that's he, there's, it's, it's dark. It's not like this funny comical thing where he goes around like sleeping with women. Right. There's like a weird functionality to all aspects to who he is. And so everything kind of weirdly serves a purpose. He's he's so mission oriented um, that there are. You know, the any indulgences or whatever uh, are part of the mission as opposed to, you know, just kind of, we'll say, perks of the job type of thing. <laughs> um, and so so he's uh, just a very driven, very driven character. And is you watching him kind of be refined. And so you see the influence of Vesper in a way on his character. So he's he's kind of arcing and kind of going back and forth between, you know, this kind of like, we'll say former special forces type guy. Um, and then going into this other setting where he has to be the kind of classy bond. So it's very cool. Um, honorable mention is Skyfall. Okay. I have to do an honorable mention before you get, you, you haven't done number one yet. Right? No, my honorable mention is definitely Skyfall. I saw Skyfall three times opening weekend. Um, I, I love the film. It's incredibly rewatchable. It's definitely oh, yeah. the best looking Roger definitely Deakins. Roger Deakins just absolutely killed it. Um, the, it has such incredible visual style. Um, and and it just takes Bond on a very interesting journey. Um, and yeah, I, I love it. I love Bond, uh, Skyfall. Um, and I would say number one is Goldeneye. Interesting. Okay. I would say number one is Goldeneye. I think Goldeneye. Um, so your top two are? My top two. No, yeah. no, no. Your top two. Oh, yes. Top two. Yes. I'm representing, you know, got the title <laughs> card for Casino Royale right here. Um, so I love, I love, when I, sometimes if I wear this shirt, I will ask people, I'll be like, I'll give you hundred dollars if you can tell me what movie this is from. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I couldn't tell you which one that was right, from. He did, You're uh, supposed to uh, recognize the topography. Yeah. So um, Goldeneye, uh, just a absolute Bond masterpiece beginning to end. I don't think I can think of anything in that film that is um, feels out of place. I think Pierce Brosnan absolutely kills it as Bond in that film. Um, and, uh, it's just amazing. And obviously the opening sequence is incredible. And especially the, uh, the, the jump from the dam, which apparently is ranked as the greatest stunt ever performed for a movie by many, by many people, okay, interesting. Uh, myself included. Okay. And so, <laughs> so yes, uh, golden eye. All right. I'll go to Sam. Uh, yeah. My top five, I'll go through the, the, Five through three quickly because we've talked about all of them. Number five, Casino Royale. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, number four, Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. right. Number three, Skyfall. There you go. Now, my top two, I'm really surprised neither of you mentioned. Okay. Uh, number two, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yes, yes. <laughs> the one and only George Lazenby. Yeah. An absolute masterpiece as well which is where i'm my t-shirt is from yeah and sorry not to go uh, not to interrupt no go ahead uh, but yes and what's funny is that one when you're talking about doing the deep dive into the bond films like what, what rediscovering it that was funny because that was all of a sudden this one that you discover that you're like oh wait there's this 
other Bond film. Like it for a weird, in a weird way, it, I don't want to say it was suppressed, but it just definitely, for some reason, didn't really seem to reach its place until maybe home video and DVD. And I think it's still, I think it's still finding people. Yeah. Um, I know a couple of years ago, Steven Soderbergh wrote a really good essay about why it's not his favorite Bond movie, but the one that he finds the most interesting cinematically and the one that he borrows from the most. Yeah. And I'd certainly another movie that Christopher Nolan has, uh, mm -hmm. has taken from the entire, uh, uh, snow fortress sequence from inception is straight from the, the climax of, uh, honor majesty's secret mm -hmm. service. It mm -hmm. also started the trend of ski chases in the Bond franchise, which is... Uh, oh, <laughs> we're going to talk about the ski chases. <laughs> ski chases. Uh, but, well, and you know what? And that is also, yeah, you know, that it's so tough because there's so many great films and Honor Majesty's Secret Service is phenomenal. And there's, if I could just say, the cinematography in it is really, really remarkable, um, especially when the whole sequence of the choppers flying through in the sunset or the sunrise um, yeah. and just the way like George Lazenby looks in that sequence. He's got the submachine gun. There's the sun well, coming through the window. George Lazenby also uh, was a um, trained martial artist. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he, I think he has at, at least until Dalton, some of the best fight scenes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's, it's really him fighting. And in fact, I'm uh, after I reveal my top one, I think we should do a little, discussion of fight scenes in, oh, in, in Bond. Yeah. Um, and my number one, From Russia With Love. Ah. Yeah, I mean. I yeah, mean. Another. It just, every single sequence in that movie is a banger. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and from, from getting on the train, the Orient Express at the midpoint of the movie, uh, the showdown, everything from that point on is just straight excitement. Um, the showdown with Robert Shaw, mm -hmm. uh, who the children will know is Quint from Jaws, <laughs> and the cool children will know is the villain from The Sting, mm -hmm. um, uh, is is just absolutely incredible. So I, I want to do a little bootleg university in the middle of this episode. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and talk about the influence of Peter Hunt on uh, modern action filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So Peter Hunt edited the first five Connery movies. And then when they switched from Connery to Lazenby, they hired Peter Hunt to be the director of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. So they elevated him from editor to director. Now, I want to take a look at what action fight scenes kind of looked like in this era. And I'm going to show a brief clips from two movies that I love from two filmmakers that I love, and I'm not disparaging these movies at all. I want to take a look at a uh, fight scene from a movie called Bad Day at Black Rock, um, in which uh, Spencer Tracy fights Ernest Borgnine. Let's see here. Get to the start of it. What year is this? This is 57 or 58. Okay. This is directed by John Sturgis, who uh, obviously a great filmmaker in his own right. But take a look at fairly stationary camera, <laughs> just throwing punches and karate chops. Uh, great movie, if you've never seen it, um, uh, sort of made at the height of McCarthyism, and uh, it's about uh, a group of horrible, racist rednecks who uh, uh, kill a Japanese man for his land. Um, and then another one of my favorite movies, Stanley Kubrick's Spartacus. This would be 60. This is 1960. So, 
Kubrick's moving the camera. It's perfectly compelling and exciting, but still fairly simple, wide shots. The most, the biggest thought process here seems to just be getting both actors in the frame. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what action scenes, that's what uh, fight scenes look like for most of cinema history. Right. And now let's take a look at From Russia With Love. This is Sean Connery versus uh, Robert Shaw. In, in a train car. It's dark, but there's two people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'll, sorry, I'll, Graham. I'll, I'll overlay yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it is every single movement of a hand is, is its own cut. It's quick cutting. Uh, it's edited by Peter Hunt. And uh, the... You, we're in close, we're getting these close-ups, these brief snippets of movement. Every single process of the fight gets its own shot. There are basically no, no wide shots in this entire sequence. And in a very real sense, this is sort of the birth of modern action editing happening on screen. So this is 1962, so the two years after the Spartacus fight we just watched. Yeah. And the brutal intensity, yeah. you know, in that way it's edited. Even to date, that's one of the more brutal fight scenes in the whole franchise. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then this is what happens when Peter Hunt gets to direct his own movie. This is a fight scene in a hotel. Uh. Uh. I mean, it's like the Hitchcock shower scene. It's a hundred cuts in two minutes. Just everything super precise. Every single movement gets a cut. And it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of thing that gets overdone now in order to hide the fact that actors can't actually fight. Yeah. And so, you know, this is this is the editing style that we eventually get to with the Bourne series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All because of of Peter Hunt, who is sort of the unsung secret hero of those early Connery movies in terms of creating something that is so vibrant and dynamic. Yeah. And just in terms of just the action editing, obviously very influential moving forward. And, you know, if I were to if I were to say, like, you know, when you look at, like, 70s filmmaking, obviously people kind of think a lot about, like, the auteur kind of era. Um, but the 60s, in my opinion, feels as though there's a lot of experimental editing going on through, you know, this era. And in many ways, you know, this is a great example of kind of just the, like, the very early aspects of that. Because then you get to the late 60s where you get like Dennis Hopper's Easy Rider. Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Midnight Cowboy, and I would say The Wild Bunch, yeah. where like editing is just- It's expressionistic. Very expressionistic. And, and, and detaching itself from being, you know, by just trying to kind of cut the pieces together and going more for an emotion or a feeling and to convey that as much as possible to an audience. And so this is like, I think one of the very early, it, right. earliest aspects it, of where people it, detached from that and were like, let's go for it's, it's exciting. You as an audience member feel like you were in the chaos of this intense fight between mm -hmm. these two people that, you know, cause it is, it is, if a fight like that is intimate and personal and scary, and that's what it should feel like in the edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Nothing wrong with an occasional judo chop. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or, but, a, you know, the double hand, you know. Also, if you've never seen Bad Day at Black Rock or Spartacus, two tremendous movies, mm -hmm. no knocks against uh, right. uh, Stanley Kubrick or John Sturgis. 
All right. So let's go to another fun category. Mm-hmm. Bond girls. Bond <laughs> girls. And uh, I should also just pause here and note, yes, we are three cis head white men discussing a franchise that uh, is not Probably. always treating women and minorities very well. Fair uh, to say that's one of its most notable qualities. <laughs> I would say so. And so we apologize, but we're also going to ogle the Bond girls now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Graham, do you have a, a, a top one or two? Yeah, I actually have like several that I picked out just as being like... <laughs> what? Graham likes the ladies? <laughs> Never okay. noticed that before. <laughs> Give me a little bit of credit. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll, I'll pick, I'll just say, I guess, like the, the number one and then like pick out a couple honorable mentions. Yeah. But I feel like, um, and again, this may be my Craig bias speaking, but I feel like uh, Vesper is kind of the only answer, for me at least. It's pretty unimpeachable. I mean, it's... I don't know. I may may just kind of discard this for being too obvious, but it's the only romance in the entire franchise that actually feels earned. And it's not just like a switch flips and she just like her barriers are broken down and she's like, you might as well sleep with them. You know? Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the first scene on the train between Vesper and Bond is incredible. I, I, another one of my favorite lines when she's like just looking him head to toe and just like just dis, like just, analyzes yeah. him perfectly, and then she asks him, "How's your lamb?" and he says, "Skewered." skewered. One, One sympathizes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Phenomenal. Yeah. So good. Um, they, yeah. They're able to they're able to break each other down in this interesting way, and so there's this in a good way this one upping that's kind of going on, but in a way that like. I don't think had been portrayed in a Bond film quite like that. And so, and you can see even when she walks away out, out of the train, he looks at her like, wow, like, yeah, like that's awesome. You know, that she was able to kind of do that with, she him. totally has his number. Yeah. And he knows yeah. Yeah. it's great. <laughs> yeah. Also, Eva Green just has like this, this ephemeral. Yeah. She looks like, like she, elfish quality. Like mm-hmm. she looks like a magical creature. Mm-hmm. It's true. And it, like she has a bearing that feels like it belongs in a classic film, like one of the older Bond mm-hmm. movies. Like or, you, could, or, you could translocate her 20 years in the past and she fit I, you right could in. You could put her in a film noir. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's why she, yeah. she's great as a femme fatale in, because mm-hmm. she looks like, you, you could swap her into any Lauren Bacall role mm-hmm. and she would be great. Right. Uh, do you have a, a number two? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to have to go with a uh, Zinnia on a top. <laughs> Famke kind of Jansen. Jansen. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. Uh, she's very masculine coded, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Like she likes all the things that Bond likes. She's like fast cars and gambling and smoking cigars and, uh, being dominant. <laughs> we'll say. Is she the only Bond girl who's a villain that never becomes a good guy? I guess Grace Jones. I, yes, oh, the, she kind of, yes, because she's like Mayday in the sense yeah. that there's, she kind of blurs the line between Bond girl and Bond thug or like a. Hench, she's, hench, she's, she's a henchwoman. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. yeah. She is filling the traditional henchman role yeah. in that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure which category to put her in, but like, I think she's a bit, either one. She's, I mean, she's such a, I mean, a standout in that movie. I feel like it had to um, Bond girl her, unfortunately, but yeah. And, uh, Obviously, she's just like a total smoke show as well, which yep. just doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think the only f- documented female orgasm in the entire franchise. I guess that would make sense for a deeply. Ma- I mean, Bond's not generally uh, caring about those things, I would assume. Fair to say James <laughs> Bond is uh, uh, not going to be a selfless lover. <laughs> Well, that's why he has to keep getting new women. They don't stick around very long. <laughs> oh, and a final honorable mention to Log Cabin Girl from The Spy Who Loved Me. That's accredited. Title. Log okay. Cabin Girl. Uh, I'm pulling this out because it is. she is the most efficient Bond girl as far as screen time as for fitting all of the... Um, everything you need to be a Bond girl into the shortest amount of time possible. She exists in the movie for like 30 seconds. And I, I pulled out this little exchange. Says, uh, but James, I need you, says Log Cabin Girl, as Bond is getting up to leave yeah. and go fight some bad guys. And he responds, so does England. <laughs> <Dark subject. laughs> 
And moments later, you find out she was actually KGB. Right, right, right. So, like, right, right. you know, she's perfect Bond girl. She does the whole thing in like 30 seconds. It's wow. great. All right, Kenny. Analysis. Um, I would. <laughs> I say, assume you had Vesper on the list as well. Um, yes, um, but uh, there's other. I do have a couple others. Okay. So uh, yes, Vesper. That's that. It as we kind of just already said, almost goes without saying to some degree. But um, and I'll run through these kind of quick. Um, Isabella Skorupko's character in Goldeneye. Uh, because I think that there's a certain kind of feisty quality with uh, that character that is interesting. She's fairly driven. Um, I like that when they're tied up in the uh, helicopter, that she's like kicking his chair. Yeah. She's very aggressive <laughs> with, <laughs> yeah. with with forcing James Bond to basically like do something, um, which I think is really, really cool. It's um, just a shame. She gets overshadowed by Famke Jansen because she's yeah. so ter uh, terrific in that movie. Yeah, she's yeah. fantastic. Um uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam Dab Dabble, how do you say her last name? Uh, the Living Daylights, Kara Milvoy's character, or the actress. You're just going to do um, The Living Daylights the for living all these categories. That one uh, really, uh, yeah. The nostalgia factor for The Living Daylights is high. So, um, yes, but I like the cello scene. I like... Um, uh, she's kind of with Bond. She's she's really like from the beginning outside of the opening sequence. She's in the movie through the entire film as well. Which um, so she's not just ne necessarily making an appearance and then kind of being you know uh, killed or we'll say discarded. You know, at a certain point, yeah. she's with Bond all the way to the very very last frame of the, the film, and so uh, she's very present in the movie. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. unusual because obviously the formula Bond movies are very like divided in half usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in there's usually a first half Bond girl, a second half Bond girl, right? Um, and then maybe the, one who dies in the middle, right? <laughs> she dies in the middle, uh, and then he meets the real Bond girl, uh, and then. Oh. And and also usually the villain doesn't really come into it in until the the second half. Like that's when you get to the lair, and mm -hmm. the first half is like a detective story leading up to. And now we found the villain, and we do the spy stuff. Yeah, right. Miriam Diabo, I believe okay. is how her name is pronounced. I'm okay. probably saying it wrong, but anyway. Um, and then uh, Barbara Bach in uh, I had spy Barbara Lady. Bach okay, as yeah. well. So, yeah. I think I believe uh, Anya Amasova. Yes. Uh, but you're going to have to go back stars. and explain who these people are because I don't, I don't remember. Their Barbara Bach is the, is the spy who loved me and the spy yeah. who okay. loved okay. me. Yeah. Or, uh, or the me the and me. James Bond is the spy, yeah. uh, right, whichever. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, she's great. She's another character that um, feels like uh, breaks a little out of the, we'll say damsel in distress kind of vibe. Um, um, but also like, you know, is kind of taken, you know, almost in a whimsical way with Bond, you know, uh, particularly in the like submarine car, um, you know, yeah. sequence. She's, um, she's also one of the first like competent Bond girls. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of damsels in distress and, you know, I, she's a scientist and just along for the ride or she's, mm -hmm. you know, valuable to the plot somehow. How and that's why she's being kept around. But uh, yeah, Barbara Bach is as competent as Bond, and that's yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then yeah, just the dynamic that's created in that film that you yeah. know he b killed her uh, lover in yeah. the opening scene, and now there's kind of that you know we'll say just tension in a sense. Um, I find interesting. So yeah, yeah. Sam. Uh, I had Eva Green as Vesper Lind yeah. and Barbara Bach as Anya Amasova, obviously. Uh, I want to shout out Ursula Andress, the very yeah. first like quintessential Bond girl mm -hmm. in Dr. No, mm -hmm. obviously emerging from the water in the white bikini is mm -hmm. like a, a, a iconic, iconic, just iconic. Um, uh, I can't believe I, I'm so disappointed in your uh, lack of love for Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Ken. Um, no, that's another <laughs> because one that's like it, it's here's the thing that one's almost like in a weird way, like a skyfall to me. Like I just everything about it is like almost it kind of almost goes without saying. But yes, I, I so Diana Rigg as Contessa Teresa Di Vincenzo. Um, Honor Majesty's Secret Service is going to get some love. Coming. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Diana Rigg, the children will know her as uh, 
Lady Olena in Game of Thrones. Oh. Um, obviously one of the best characters on a show full of great characters. Um, but before she was an old woman, she was one of the most adorable and beautiful women on the planet. Um, and it's hard not to fall in love with her in that movie, which James Bond does. And he marries her at the end. Mm -hmm. And then Tracy Bond. Yeah. And then, she and then spoiler alert. <laughs> This movie's like 50 years old. They right? had all the time in the world. And I think the ending of On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a big part of my love for that movie and my love for the, the Contessa character. Uh, so after they get married at the end, Blofeld drives by, kills her, and then it ends with James Bond crying over her dead body. It's okay. like the original Casino Royale ending mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a shockingly subtle performance by Lazenby in that scene. Too. Yes. Like I, was, yeah. I was kind of amazed. There's no wailing. It's just, we had all the time just in the world. In, in denial mm -hmm. about yeah. It. yeah, that's great. Um, and it's, it is the first like tragic ending of Bond, of mm -hmm. a Bond movie. And you can see the influence of that on Casino Royale, mm -hmm. on Skyfall, on No Time to Die. Like the, they are all attempting to get to that place mm -hmm. at right. the end of those movies, which is why uh, they use the, the song from the Honor Majesty's Secret Service, We Had All the Time in the World, uh, throughout No Time to Die. And as, as soon as they played that song, at the beginning of No Time to Die, I was like, oh shit, spoiler, James Bond is going to die at the end of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, they also use uh, John Barry's uh, theme for Honor Majesty's Secret Service in No yeah. Time to Die, uh, which yeah. was also very exciting. Yeah. All right, favorite henchman. I'll, I'll start. Yeah, I, start. I've got, so I, we've already talked about Xenia on the top. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's, she's on my list too, but I already counted her. So yeah, her I was unsure if I could count Robert Shaw as Red Grant in From Russia with Love mm -hmm. because technically he's working for someone else, um, but he uh, he's kind of the main villain of that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to say. I'm going to count him because I love Robert Shaw. Um, then the, the, the top two classic Bond henchmen. Number one, Richard Keel is Jaws. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, he's, he's kind of what you think of when you think of a henchman. He's giant. He's got the metal teeth. He's, you know, the, a good henchman has to have a gimmick. Yeah. Filmmakers out there, henchmen have to have a gimmick. <laughs> if, if you're going to send somebody to fight the hero, give them something memorable to do, which is, I think one of the biggest problems with the Craig movies, which I over the overall love the Craig movies, mm -hmm. not really henchmen forward movies. We need I, some henchmen. I can't really think of any henchmen in it. The, the, uh, uh, Dave Batista uh, is Dave briefly Batista. inspector. He had like um, one scene. Yeah, yeah. They, they've got the guy with the, the eye, the and, eye no and no die. time to die, which is the closest they get, I think to a henchman with a gimmick. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, I know it's super cheesy, but I like that Jaws gets a redemption arc in Moonraker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and Harold Sakata as Odd Job in Goldfinger yeah. Yeah. with mm -hmm. the throw in the hat. bowler hat yeah. and slicing off heads. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And he did that. Like he was that, that he like trained for that and just yeah. did it. Like that wasn't, I mean, it was, it wasn't an actual marble statue. It was like a foam thing or whatever, but sure. he was like, he had his metal rimmed hat and he just practiced for like five months until he could do it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. All right. Who wants to go? Um, I guess I'll go. Um, oh gosh, I'm going to put Mayday in the henchman category. Um, Grace Jones. Yeah. Um, I, she is, she is second to Christopher Walken. In yes. Yeah. And uh, also she has super strength which is yeah. one of the <laughs> characteristics of a Bond, great Bond henchman. For some reason, they have like some level of superhuman ability to just like lift and throw things. Um, and uh, I love that. Um, and then I'm going to say, um, and she feels very threatening, you know, 
Um, so I love gonna, her absolutely wild choice of assassination weapon. Yeah, a uh, uh, a fishing rod controlled attack yeah. butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, some very uh, elaborate uh, assassinations. They, they were making choices in those later <laughs> yeah. Roger Moore movies. Yeah. You can't say they weren't making choices. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw... Uh, okay, well, Jaws is on the list. Um, I would put uh, it between, let's say, uh, Necros. Necros, again, A Living Daylights. Um, I love the milk oh, bombs. He throws, he throws bombs that are in... Cart little glass milk containers. Um, and is it the one who strangles with the yes, headphones? The headphones. Yeah. And before you go, oh, another Living Daylights. That end scene in the Living Daylights when they're dangling from the plane. Um, mm -hmm. Another phenomenal stunt. Um, yeah. Very practically done. Uh, that's super cool. And uh, can we throw Nick Nack in there? I her, think, her, yeah. Villages' Vilich character. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love. Uh, I love Nick Knack. I, the end scene. From the man, from with, the man golden with the golden gun. gun. Um, you know, obviously he has a, a fight scene with um, Bond at the very, very end of the movie. And uh, it's uh, clever and fun. And uh, maybe, I mean, I don't know if it's the best representation. Um, you know, like, Bond's a little demeaning to him. Um, so I'll point that out, but at the same time, uh, great character and, uh, yeah, just kind of fun. Again, a henchman with a, I'll say that stands out, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. specific characteristics. So, uh, yeah, nothing you guys haven't already mentioned, uh, Jaws just, it's just pinnacle as far as I'm concerned. Like he's just so classic and iconic and, uh, Red Grant as well, who, um, he feels like one of the few henchmen who really has Bond like cold, like just totally ha um, has him pinned down. There's nothing he can do. And it's just like, there's a menace to him that I feel like a lot of the hench people don't really manage to achieve. Like there's an intelligence behind right. it, Robert it, Shaw's eyes that a lot of these mm. people don't have. Yeah. And like you, you get the sense Bond is actually in, peril as opposed to just being in, you know, some sort of action shenanigans, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting to point out with the Bond henchman characters is a lot of times they actually outlast the main villain right. of the movie. And mm -hmm. so they really are, you know, not throwaway characters, but in some ways the ultimate threat the Bond's going right. to face. Classically, I mean, Bond, the final showdown is Bond versus odd job at the end of Mm -hmm. Goldfinger, right? Yeah. Not Bond versus Goldfinger, which seems like he would win pretty. Or and, Bond versus <laughs> yeah. <Nick Nack. laughs> Exactly. All right, let's talk villains. Yeah. What makes a good Bond villain? Um. Well, definitely they've got to want to destroy the entire planet in some elaborate plot. <laughs> um, but that's not always the case. Obviously, Le Chiffre in uh, Casino Royale is a very unique villain in the sense that he's like kind of got his back up against the wall. He's desperate. He's a desperate villain. Uh, he's still very efficient and threatening, um, but... He's like a cornered cobra. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. which makes him in some ways even more dangerous because he's got a lot on the line himself. Um, but I am not uh, against the kind of very elaborate Bond villains as well. So, you know... Um, you know, yeah, I think I've already spoken of my love for Hugo Drax. I have yeah. Hugo Drax mm -hmm. as, as one of the best. On uh, shout out to Michael Lonsdale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but it's just like yeah, it's just is is hitting all the notes. It's just completely over the top. And mm -hmm. I think it, it, I have a Goldfinger on here. Uh, Gert Frobe, who was the live action actor, and then Michael Collins was his voice because Gert Frobe couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think it's. I think a great Bond villain has to have like a ruthless intelligence. That's the key. And and as we saw in the the scene, do you expect me to talk? No, I expect you to die. Mm -hmm. Like this, just this coldness, this mm -hmm. give no fucks attitude. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's Goldfinger is interesting because like he has some iconic moments and he has this kind of intelligent quality, but he's also like. His chief characteristic is that he's petty. Yeah. Like he's, we meet him cheating at cards. 
And then Bond does his usual thing where he walks up to the villain and says, hi, I'm your enemy. And they hang out for a while. <laughs> and like <laughs> he then proceeds to cheat at golf. And it's just like, this is what he's most known for is not like his high stakes villain plan. He's, it's a, that like he's just kind of cheats at stuff. He's just kind of a little bit petty. And you, you know what I've, I've never realized before, but I just now thought he's Goldfinger is Trump. He's very oh, yeah. Trumpy. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the obsession with gold is like right. <laughs> right. right. Also probably, I think it has one of my favorite like villain plots, not just in Bond, but like ever mm -hmm. for like, I'm not going to rob Fort Knox. I'm going to explode a bomb in Fort Knox so that the price of all the other gold in the world goes up because I've damaged <laughs> the supply. <laughs> uh, I have Javier Bardem as Raul Silva. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, probably the best um, villain scene mm -hmm. in any yeah. Bond movie. When he's, uh, scene when he slowly walks up right. from the chair. Mm -hmm. I, my it's grandmother terrible. had an island. It was nothing to boast of. That was terrible. Fabi Bardem, well, but yeah. That opening, yeah, that scene when he comes in, because I remember the first time uh, watching Skyfall and in the theater, and there was like a palpable tension when his character comes in at the midpoint, and it really holds on that long shot as he's essentially, if I remember correctly, it kind of holds for quite a while on that shot as he's approaching Bond. I'm and, it's, you know, and you see, you know, he the threat feels like it's, it's building and building and building as he's coming up to Bond, which... Um, it's not built around necessarily anything elaborate around him. It's the performance of the the actor and the character. I'm always stunned at just how perfectly timed that monologue is. He concludes it on the final step. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and it's just like, oh man, it's like a coiled spring ready to go off. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, how long did this guy rehearse this? Yeah. The villain, I mean, not yeah. Javier Bardem. Yeah, I mean both, why not? <laughs> um. And then uh, Sean Bean is Alec Trevelyan uh, in... Uh, Dude, you just named all mine. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah, 100%. And, and sorry not to jump in on that, but the reason I, I like Silva and Alec Trevelyan is um, because they feel like the shadow versions yeah. of Bond. Is, so. is, is Silva ever explicitly mentioned as a double O? It doesn't. I doesn't say it, but he was. Because you make it as, as though he was the you know Bond's predecessor, right? And ultimately discarded, you know, so that Bond could come in. Yeah, but Sean Bean was 006. 006, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And so uh, obviously, you know, a fairly bold move, I think, making another double O the villain of a uh, of a Bond film. So you know, he stands out, and then just their relationship, that scene in GoldenEye when they're standing amongst all the kind of relics of the Cold mm -hmm. War, um, when it's revealed that he's the bad guy, um, is just great. Like, it just has such a mood about it, and just the just the fact that they're standing in this graveyard of the Cold War as these two kind of, like, you know, um, former friends and, and essentially themselves, as it's kind of said in GoldenEye Relics of the Cold War, kind of creates this really, really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do one shout out, though, Honor Majesty's Secret Service uh, to Telly Savalas. Okay. So uh, Telly Savalas was, um, I don't know, he probably passed away before you guys were born. No, I think mid 90s. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I love uh, Kojak himself. Kojak yeah. himself. And I love the, you know, the bobsled scene at the end of Honor Majesty's it's, Secret Service. The side note. My grandfather, who was Greek, mm -hmm. looked dead on like Telly Savalas. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So was... that's that, my main knowledge of the existence of Telly Savalas was always, that's the guy that my grandpa looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. And he, uh, you know, he ultimately kind of, like we mentioned earlier, he kind of ultimately manages to beat Bond. Yeah. Um, so. so Savalas is the second version of Blofeld, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. I put... Um, Donald Pleasance mm -hmm. as Blofeld in uh, You Only Live Twice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I which, was going to call that one out as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like, because Blofeld is like the shadow puppet master throughout the first four Bond, uh, Connery Bond movies, Goldfinger excluded. Um, but he's, you know, obviously the, uh, he's the leader of Spectre. And uh, we finally see his face in... I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. They told me you were assassinated in Hong Kong. 
Yes, this is my second life. <laughs> you only live twice, Mr. Bond. Target vehicle. <laughs> Just the 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 design of the makeup, the weird eye, the mm-hmm. scar, the bald head. Donald Pleasance just underplaying it mm-hmm. Obviously, in that creepy way. You know, very uh, Dr. Evil. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's a, Blofeld is like a study in restraint, which is interesting, contrasting him with basically every other Bond villain. Because, mm-hmm. like, I mean, you know, it takes what? This is like the fourth movie? This is the fifth movie. Fifth. And he's teased for the previous four movies pretty right. much as, like, being being there in the background. So first of all, just the restraint of not having him appear right away is crazy. But then like you actually see him and he's like diminutive kind of soft spoken, like, you know, just, just really dialing it back. And like, uh, it's, it's crazy. It actually leaves, leaves more of an impact as if he was like a, you know, Hugo Drax style, like pontificating real hard. And compare this to, I'm sorry, what they fucking did inspector. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I I hate Spectre for what they did to Blofeld. First of all, making him James Bond's like adoptive brother, like that is such hacky modern day screenwriting horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> but also like I like Christoph Waltz yeah, a great. lot. Oh, he's obviously. Um I think he is I think they just said who's and a, a vague, who's like a European Oscar winner? Yeah. Who's played a villain before and slotted him into the role without really thinking through what Blofeld as a character is. Um, they do an okay job with his introduction where he's like soft spoken and quiet and in the shadows, but that's like, that's what Blofeld should be throughout the whole movie. Um, but yeah, I, I I just hate that they felt like they needed to connect him to Bond's childhood and also to try to retcon the previous movies that he was the mastermind behind everything. Mm. Like, no, it doesn't work. If you don't set it up like we see Blofeld in the shadows, we don't see his face, we see him stroking his cat in the previous Connery Bond movies. And so it's set up. You know what Spectre is. You know that all these previous villains work for Spectre. Uh, and so there's a sense of anticipation. It's like the writers and producers of of uh, Spectre saw the horrible, horrible con reveal in uh, in Star Trek Into Darkness, and we're like, can we do it even worse? <laughs> uh, so, Ken, who have you got that I haven't said, or Graham? Uh, no, do you have anybody I, I haven't we, said? We covered them all. Okay. Yeah. No. Special shout out to uh, Chris, Christopher Walken for just oh, the yeah. Yeah. weirdest Walken, performance. Walken, Christopher Lee. Um. Christopher Lee. I want to include Christopher Lee, but that movie is so awful. It, and and yeah. like, I'm sorry, the you'll you'll be able to identify him yeah, by his awkward. his <laughs> his very uh, distinguishing mark. His third nipple. <laughs> Zoom in yeah, to yeah. this uh, prosthetic third nipple on his chest. It's, it's such an odd choice. Like, I don't care if that was in the book. You gotta just give him a scar or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a weird, yeah. weird thing. Well, Christopher Walken also um, is, I think, a very strong honorable mention. Yeah. Because he really seems to relish in playing uh, the character and is very, um, he's just totally sadistic. He's I mean, just really unhinged. Yeah. yeah. It, it also, it, it sort of feels like the start of we're going to not get, instead of getting character actors for the villains, we're going to get movie stars to play the villain. Mm-hmm. We're going to get like Oscar right. winners and Oscar nominees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's one that like definitely he earns his, you know, you, you, you want Bond to really take this guy out, yeah. you know, so. but you know, he can't be, uh, on the list though, because he's, he's not disfigured. So oh, yeah, you there do? we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Graham's making excellent points. <laughs> uh, the Bond neophyte, as he said. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, you've done incredible work getting through <laughs> 19 Bond movies in the last month. 